Hello, my name is Matthias Aron Olsson and the name of my autobiography is Reykjavik, the 11th of September 2001, examining through the lenses of microhistory and eco-documents how a young boy in Iceland experienced a world event. The memory as a source and academic discourse on the matter. What role do memories play in academic fields of study, particularly history, and more importantly, what role can they play and how significant is that role? Through the years, the debate on the matter has been substantial, with many new arguments coming forth regarding new ways to recount past events, especially painful ones, such as how memories are made and what processes they follow. Before that, Memories as sources usually didn't qualify as a strong and reliable ground in itself to study history on, compared to written documents, as scholars tended to believe that those sources were more scientific in nature. But memories can be a welcome material in historical researches, as it can, for example, be interesting to compare two completely different experiences by two completely different persons of the same event or phenomenon. By doing this, it can be demonstrated how important the individual as a research unit can be for the larger context and also how an individual or a small group experiences an event or phenomenon. They then relay on what is usually called private memory. In comparison, smaller groups or some part of the society can experience these same events with the aid of what is sometimes called collective memory. Then the group has collectively made a compromise on what would be considered important about that particular event. The individual memory is then secondary in that memory production. In this autobiography, I will make an attempt to outline my own experience based on my own private memory of an event that has a strong footing in the collective memory of the world. It is not the purpose of my work to demonstrate that my private memory is in some way different from the larger collective memory. Rather, I will be showing how one historical event that has been formed by the historical memory of the world affected my memory in an expected way. Eco-documents and microhistory. Microhistory can be a useful method in dealing with the memory of an individual and discussion of topics such as specific events or periods in the life of a person. Microhistory tends to tackle the smaller units of the past. For example, a person's experience of single events and their environment, usually in an unusual way. It's possible to use the methods of microhistory when it comes to eco-documents, also known as life writing. The form tackles the person's ego, how it represents itself, and is made mostly of that person's memories. Eco documents can then be differ differentiated into five types. Autobiography, semi-autobiography, conversational books, autofiction, and biographies. Here I will use the autobiographical form as I will be the protagonist of this narration. An excellent description of the autobiographical form can be found in Sigurður Gilvi Magnússon's work, Dreams of Things Past. Their Sigurður, among other things, describes this form as when a person makes an organized attempt to look back upon a world path, weigh their lifetime and evaluate it. Its importance consists mainly in the person's understanding of their own life and the context that can be brought forth from the author's life, his companions and the society in whole. This description does a good job of covering this form and what sources are used in its representation. After all, it's the author that's evaluating his own lifetime and is thus in total control when it comes to putting pen to paper. That being said, it's also important to reflect on what dangers can occur when work, working, working, working with a memory and memories as a source for academic work. The dangers in question can be things such as elements that shape and influence how we evoke memories and then value them. These elements can take the shape of a person's predetermined ideas about the past that have been shaped later through their lifetime, the effects of other people's experiences 
and their valuation on another person's memory. In the end, the memory can also be deceitful. But even though memories might possibly collide in some way with other sources such as family memory and the memory of friends, photographers, drawings and even live broadcasts, that in itself can be interesting to examine. The discrepancies that might arise can derive from interesting reasons that can be food for thought. Can people simply experience events and phenomena in such inco incomparably different ways or does the fault lie in the memories themselves that have changed with time and have been polished, polished with different values and environments of the person that finds new perspectives as the memories move further back in time? To counter the dangers mentioned before, a person can approach their memories with certain support pillars to strengthen the representation of memories of past events, such as the use of sources other than just the memory, along with the emphasis and value of the person puts on them. These can be diaries, photographs and even drawings, for example. When a memory crosses your mind and paints a certain picture that you want to present, these sources can be used to give that same picture more color, depth and more character in its presentation. Furthermore, memories can be observed, examined and studied through various different concepts and theories. In doing so, a person can observe their memories through different perspectives and perhaps form a different evaluation on them, put through, but through without changing the memories in any way, minding the dangers that were mentioned before. The September 11 attacks and morbid curiosity. One concept that I will be using in the term is the term morbid curiosity. It applies to the state of mind when a person seeks out information that is overwhelmingly negative in nature and applies mostly to pain, violence and even death. But this curiosity does not have to be unhealthy to a person and no doubt has everybody experienced this type of curiosity in some quantity sometime in their lifetime. The concept has quite a wide range and can be described in everything from mild interest in horror films and crime shows to huge interest in violence in the news, death and either graphic or verbal. The question that perhaps comes to mind is when does a person first experience such a curiosity? Or should we say, can children experience morbid curiosity? In September 2002, it seems that I, at the age of eight, might possibly have experienced this type of curiosity over a certain period after I had watched a documentary on TV. On March 10th, 2002, the French-American documentary 9-11 was premiered on the American TV station CBS. What makes this documentary unique is that it's made from video recordings by the brothers Jules and Gideon Noday, and it is long believed that Jules was the only person to capture the moment on video when the first plane flew on the North Tower of the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. Originally, the documentary was supposed to follow a rookie in a New York fire station, not the horrific events that took place that day. The documentary was hugely successful in the US and holds the record for the largest audience ever for a TV documentary with 39 million viewers watching when aired on CBS. As the documentary follows a group of firefighters who had to deal with these unimaginable circumstances, it in turn shows the attacks from the, and the people that lost their lives that day, on that fateful day, with great vicinity and honesty. This factor played a large role in the film's success as it must have evoked strong feelings among the general public all over the world only six months after the incident took place. One year earlier, I too had witnessed this same horrific event that this documentary covers through the living room TV in my childhood home after my brother had called me inside as I was playing. My memory of this event is rather clear as I remember the moment I came inside to see what all the fuss was about. I remember the atmosphere among my brothers and his friends who were watching the live broadcast. It was electric and tense, but though at the same time, 
it was with a sense of excitement. They were only kids, they were only three years older than I, and only kids at the time, which in turn probably meant that they didn't fully understand what was happening and the scope of horror. In my autobiography, I will try to capture these memories and emotions regarding these two events. On the one hand, how I experienced the 9-11 attacks, and on the other hand, when I saw the TV documentary about these same attacks a year later, which in turn led me to becoming obsessed with them. Furthermore, I will then assess and examine if I might possibly have experienced some sort of morbid curiosity at this period of my life, or if I simply didn't understand both the severity of it all and how horrifying this event was and might have simply been drawn to the sheer magnitude of it. <laughs> Fragmented memories and the appropriate methodology. There is one both puzzling and curious aspect of my memory of that day in September 2001, which I don't fully understand. I recall the graphic outlook of the event on the TV quite differently than it actually was in real life. But simply because these memories are certainly fragmentary and perhaps erroneous, it doesn't devalue them, not for me anyways. When I think of these memories and the period, I rather get a sort of comprehensive feeling. And it is that exact feeling I will deal with in my autobiography. Meanwhile, I examine and assess it along with these memories, no matter how fragmented they are, which it consists of. With this method, I intend to, on the one hand, evaluate and assess my memories, interview my family, examine drawings by myself, look at my parents' diary, watch a certain documentary, as well as utilize other printed sources. I will visit the site of memory, my childhood home, and the surrounding area, as well as examine photographs from the period when it comes to the methodology, I will make an honest attempt to put all these memories on paper in a way which I have first fully figured them out before I look at the other sources. By doing this, I will seek to isolate these memories in a certain way, without in any way claiming that they are completely untouched or fully pure, before I support them with other sources, such as those mentioned before. In the end, by approaching the subject in this matter, I hope to a. make the best possible representation of the material b. try and make sure that the method is objective in its nature c. bring out possible paradoxes that might be just as interesting as their absence and d. in the end, try and understand this period in my life through the microhistorical and autobiographical form. <laughs>